The option one we mentioned is to make the notation itself parametric. And this is essentially just performing dynamic dispatching manually. So how can we achieve this? Well, we do it as we usually do in computer science. We just add a level of indirection. We add a level of indirection, which is to say we have a structure that is abstracting what is the bind and the pure operations. So let's store those in its structure. And then before we call bind or pure, we look up in the structure to know which one we should call. And this is why it's called dynamic dispatching because the idea is that the actual operation is looked up dynamically when the call is performed. So let's see how that develops. First, we create a structure, and we'll call it monad just for the sake of consistency. And the monad has two fields. The first one, we're going to store the bind operation, and the second one, we're going to store the pure. I need to change the macro just so that it calls internally bind and pure. So now, the best thing to do is just show you an example. Let me show you an example. So now what the macro is, I changed the name a bit so that you don't confuse it. And I call it do with. And with, the parameter is which macro we're going to use. So what is going to happen is whenever you see an arrow, what we do is we look up in this structure that we define. Um, here we're creating a value of a monad. And we're setting what is the bind and what is the pure operators, right? So whenever we perform the arrow, what the macro is going to be doing is it's going to be looking up what is the field bind of list M. And here the same thing. What is the list bind of what is the field bind of list M? And finally pure what it does is what is the field pure of list M. So that's why it's known as dynamic dispatching because pure has to look up in list M what is the actual implementation of pure. In this case, list pure. Same for bind. Have to it it goes into two steps, right? The the level of indirection. First, you call, you look up the field last bind, and then you call last bind list bind with the argument that was given. So let's see in terms of code how this works out. So this is the file that I'm gonna add to the class exercises. Um, and as you can see, this is the EFF bind and pure, the same for the error monad, and the same for the list monad. We have the bind and pure for each of them. So then what I did was I defined a structure monad that has two fields, bind and pure, and this is just the, the macro. And notice what it's doing whenever we do an arrow, what we're going to do is actually look up what is the bind in the structure M, and then call it somehow. So let's disregard how that is performed. And now let's see an example. So here we are defining a monad, calling the, the list monad, and you should only have one global monad for each one, right? Only going to have three in this case, one for the list monad, one for the air monad, and finally one for the state monad. And today we're just going to look at the list monad and then the, the state monad. So if I run this, it's again the running example of the list monad. And what I should see, I should see the pairs, right? For each x, y, and 1, 2, 3, 4, pair them together. So you can see here the pure operator and the two binds. And this is known as dynamic dispatch because you're dynamically looking up list M to know which operations correspond to each of these notations. Okay, so note that pure is not actually a function call, is a keyword that is understood by the macro in that context. So if I write pure here, it is not defined. Right, pure is un unknown. Okay, so in the second example, I just implemented copy-pasted push and pop from uh, lecture 28. And I define my state monad that takes the FF bind and the FF pure. And now what I did was I defined multiplication 
as before with the do monad. So it takes the state monad. And what I'm doing is I'm popping x, I'm popping y, and then I'm pushing x times y. So if I pass, if I call mult and I pass the state, it should perform a multiplication of that. So let's see that happening. As we know, the result of a, of a, a state monad is an EFF, where the first parameter is going to be the new state, in this case a list with a single element, so 1 times 2, actually it would make more sense to do 2 times 3, and C6. Okay, right, so we did 2 times 3, we pushed back 6, and that is our state, and as we know, Pushing actually does not do and does not return anything, so the result is void. So as we can see, we generalized the notation with this idea of dynamic binding. Another another way to observe dynamic binding is when you call the um, you define a class, you extend that class in a new subclass, and the subclass may call a method that is either on the on the current class or in the superclass. So we'll see a bit how we could implement that as well in later in, in a module just dedicated for object oriented. But for now, I wanted to show you just the idea of dynamic binding, which is just looking up a function call according to some conditions, according to the value, I guess. So yeah, in the next slide what we're going to see is how we can do dynamic dispatching the same idea but using the record language the facilities that are also built in in the language makes it a bit easier to define <laughs>